So what does God actually want? Does God want stuff? Does God want an amazing church building? Does he want to get us to give all of our money? Does God want us to be perfect? What is it that God really wants from us? What should we be striving to give God? Sorry, I'm not used to my face up there. <laughs> Sorry. So when me and Katrina, when we were first dating, uh, we were like six months, maybe a year into this, and I have gotten her permission to tell this story, so don't, don't think that she's surprised. Um, when we were first dating, it was, it was my birthday or Christmas or something. I don't know. She, she felt she needed to give me a gift. And she, uh, this is where she earned the, the, the idea that she is just not very good at gifts, is this story. So um, she was racking her brain. She's like, I got to find the perfect gift for Caleb. I got to find the perfect thing. And she's like, okay. So she's on the internet. She's on all the, the, the pages you find, like 10 things your boyfriend wants from you for his birthday. All those pages, right? She's on all of those. She's scrolling through Facebook. Instagram wasn't a thing because we're old. Uh, she's scrolling through all that. And she's like, I've got to find the perfect gift. And she comes along this watch and she thinks, oh, this is it. Okay. Precursor. I love cars. I like cars a lot. Cars are fun. Uh, I used to like them a lot more when I was younger because now I'm a pastor and cars are expensive. Um, so having, I, I know a lot about cars. I like cars, but um, I, don't, I don't like look at cars. Like, it's not what I'm wanting to do right now because I can't afford it. Uh, and that's okay because I really don't need to. So she finds this watch. And instead of a normal watch face, like you know the hands and all that, it's, it looks like a speedometer. Okay, It was a cool idea. And so she's like, this is it. He loves cars. I got it. Perfect gift. So she wraps it up, puts a bow on it, as you do for, for gifts. And she brings it to me on the day of whatever the gift giving was. I forgot what day it was. Birthday, Christmas, insert day here. Um, so she brings it to me. And I open it up. And I was 18, 19 years old. I don't have the greatest um, bad gift face out there. I don't. And so she's instantly like, oh, this was not the greatest gift. Okay. It was a very good idea, but it was poorly executed by the makers of the watch. Okay. It looked like a speedometer. The lights were too bright to where you couldn't read the numbers. It was also very hard to even read. Like you just like, okay, I got one, two, three, and it went up like this. And just like, I don't know what time it is. Okay. I'm just going to look at my phone. So it was a great idea. She had this great idea. She spent all this effort, but it didn't really work out. It wasn't really what I wanted. Fast forward, uh, now we are engaged. It is, we're, we're just out of college or, or finishing up college. We're engaged, and she's going, it's birthday, and she's going through the same thing. She's like, what am I going to get Caleb? I have become the worst gift giver ever, uh, while Caleb has become the best gift giver ever because I'm, I'm good at gifts. Uh, guys in here, here's the way to do that. Four months before her birthday, just listen. When you're at the store or she's on the phone, she's like, oh, this is cool. Just listen and like write it down, okay? Uh, that's all I do. And, and she, she really, like she has told me that I am way too bad, good at, at gifts and she is not. And it kind of is a fun little thing that we have. Um, so she's, again, in this turmoil of what am I going to get Caleb? I don't want to get him something bad. I want to get him something great. I wanted to get him the best gift ever, okay? So she's going around and she finally finds uh, that the local airport there in Longview, Texas does a like one hour introductory um, flight lesson kind of thing, okay? And uh, I love planes. At this point, Katrina's like, oh yeah, Caleb likes planes. But I love planes, okay? Uh, let me just tell you how much. When I was six months old, my parents took me to an air show with my grandfather. My grandfather loved planes as well, and that's where I get it. Uh, and since then, I was infatuated. Like, I was just amazed by the airplanes, okay? I love planes. Uh, my grandfather had a couple that you could, like, fly in. Uh, he had a, a bunch of models, and so every year, we would go out to his house. I lived in California. He lived in South Carolina, so we went out once a year because it was far. Um, and that whole week, we would spend the entire time flying, either whether with models or with the, the ones that he had. He had a bunch. He had a Waco. He had a Tiger Moth. He had an Aronka Chief. For those of you who know planes, it's pretty cool. For those of you who don't, they're just planes. Um, but... We would spend the whole time flying. Either we would be in the planes flying or flying the models or we would be building the models. And when I got to be like eight, he drove out from South Carolina and brought me my own plane so me and my dad could fly there while at our house, which was awesome. And then when I was about 12, he told me, hey, you have progressed. You are good enough to get your own model. Build it yourself. I'll give you all the, the internal stuff, the radio, the servos, the motor, all that. You just build the model, like the, the balsa thing, okay, out of wood. 
And I did that, and it was great. And then when he was, um, when I was about 13, he had a stroke. And uh, he was too worried after that to take any of his grandchildren up flying anymore. He could still fly, but his thought was, if I have a stroke in the air, that, like, my, my grandkids might not get down, um, was his thought, which was a good thought, but it was sad for me. I was about 13. So she finds, back to Katrina, she finds this introductory flight lesson at the local airport, buys it, thinks, all right, Caleb likes planes, this will be fine, whatever. I'm already bad enough at gifts, okay? Birthday comes, I open up, and it's in a card, and I open it up, and I'm a slow reader, so it took me a while to do this, so I'm sitting there, and she's just staring at me. Uh, there was a picture of the plane. It was a Cherokee something or other. Um, and I started reading, and it took me forever because I'm a slow reader. And uh, I, I'm like, I look up, and I'm just like, what? what? Re- really? I was in shock. This was the greatest gift still to this day, the greatest gift she has ever given me. And she's kind of mad at herself because she gave me this gift so early uh, that she really ruined the rest of the gifts a little bit. Um, but this one that she thought was just not great was amazing. It was the best gift I've ever gotten. Uh, the, the pilot there, we, we went up there. She got to go with us. There was four seats. She got to go with us. She didn't have a headset, so she had no idea what was going on. Uh, but we had headsets, so we were talking. And he let me fly probably a lot more than normal uh, because I had been flying with my grandfather. I knew what to do. I understood how to do it. I just hadn't done it in eight years at that point. Um, and flew around. We got to fly over my house at that time, which was really cool. I got to see my dog in the backyard. It was always fun. Uh, and, it, and it still is one of the best like gifts that I've ever gotten Um, so to that day, awesome gift, right? And that is kind of what we're talking about today. Since the beginning of time, humans have been just trying to figure out what to give God, what God actually wants from us. Man, thinking of what God or the gods wants, and they come up with all these crazy ideas, right? Um, and maybe there's some, some demon stuff in there. I don't know. Maybe. Probably was. Back in. So, but in the Old Testament, we have examples of, of Baal, Ashereth, and Chamosh. Uh, Ashereth worship consisted of wailing around and calling out to them, and un- often led to women sacrificing their hair and their virginity. Baal, or Baal, I don't know why I got Baal, but I always say that. Baal, um, we can see a, a picture of Baal worship. What did that look like in 1 Kings 18, 26 to 29? It says, Baal, or Baal, answer us, but there was no sound. No one answered. They danced around the altar they had made. They shouted loudly. They cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until blood gushed over them. In other areas of Baal worship, it consisted of burnt offerings and sometimes even human burnt offerings as sacrifices for Baal. Not good. Uh, As for Chamosh, uh, we see the king of Moab, His kingdom's being invaded and attacked by the Israelites, and he goes and he's going to appease the god Chamosh, and he takes his firstborn son, the son set up to be king, and sacrifices him as a burnt offering, which is insane to me. Like, I could not do that. And that that story comes from 2 Kings 3.27. But in more recent years, you know, that's all Old Testament stuff, so what? More recent years, the Native Americans had specific dances to their gods for good rain or good crops. Or in today's world, Mormons believe that upholding the Ten Commandments will cleanse away the stain of sin. In, in, in Islam, they have the five pillars of Islam, confession, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and pilgrimage. But none of these do what they're trying to do. They don't appease God. They don't fix the problem. They don't take away our sin. They don't cleanse away the stain of sin. None of them work. None of these sacrifices works, good deeds. None of them fix our problem. In Psalms 143, 2, it says, No one alive is righteous in your sight. No one. Isaiah 6, 46, All of us have become like something unclean, and all our, our righteous acts are like polluted garment, dirty rags. All of us wither away like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. James 2.10, for whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. That one gets me. One, one thing. You mess up one time, you're ruined forever. One time. Nothing we can do is worthy. Romans talks about, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Yet, as humans, we still try. 
We still do all these good deeds. We still think, oh, I can, I can make it up. Oh, it's okay. I did one bad thing. I'm going to go do six good things over here, and that'll be better. It'll outweigh, you know, the scales of, of heaven as, as has, has been theorized before. But Paul even speaks on this and how he be- had this belief when he was a Pharisee. In Philippians 3, it says, Although I have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding righteousness that is the law, blameless. Paul did pretty well. He was a Pharisee, which was a big deal. He went out and persecuted the, the, the people who were falling away from the law, the way that would be the Christians, the church at that point. He went out and he was like, I'm going to get them because God wants me to get them, right? He was doing all the right things. But listen to what he says next. But everything that was gain, what was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Everything he just listed, you know, all of the, the circumcised the eight day, the nation of Israel, born of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew regarding the law, a Pharisee, he, was, he persecuted the church, he was blameless in the law. All of that, pointless, is a loss. That's what we're going to be talking about today, is what God actually wants from us. So turn with me to Luke 18, 9 through 14. This passage uh, is directly after the passage of the persistent widow. And Jared didn't do a a lesson on the persistent widow. Um, But they are in here together, and they both have to do with prayer, which is kind of why we think they're in here together. Either they both happened at the same exact time, you know, one after the other, or Luke, the author of Luke, uh uh, he put them in here together because they both have a similar theme. One is about prayer, the other is about prayer, right? Right? So, because Jared didn't do us a lesson on this, you guys ready for a mini-sermon? Okay, here we go. The persistent widow was teaching us that we should pray often and consistently because if an unrighteous judge will give in to her request out of annoyance, how much more will the righteous Lord who loves you take care of you and your requests of him? We should be persistent in our prayers. Boom, mini-sermon right there, all right? All right, I'll see you all later. No, I'm just kidding. All right, but... The second passage, Luke 18, 9 through 14, is saying something different about prayer. It's saying more, in addition to persistence, we should also, it talks about what God actually wants and how, what he wants from our prayers, how we should pray, the attitude of our prayers, okay? So let's get into this. Verse 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down, trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Jesus here begins to teach to some specific people around him, and he had specific people in mind when he brought this up. This group that he is talking to, or the intended audience, definitely consisted of Pharisees, due to the way they talked about trusted in themselves that they were righteous. But it would have also consisted of others who were very devout in their Jewish faith that was taught by the Pharisees. See, the primary teaching going on in the temple at this time was taught by the the Pharisees, and it was that of self-righteousness through good works, rituals, keeping of the law, as well as the additions that the Pharisees made to the law. See, they had this whole other book, and I forgot the name of it, but this whole other book that had a whole bunch of additions to the law, Like, for example, uh, the law says that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy, right? Easy, okay? But they had specific things, like you can't walk this far on the Sabbath day. If you do, you're you're, you're breaking the law. And that was how far they deemed someone should live from the temple, okay? They made up all these extra laws to help keep them in, in the law. It was kind of like it started out as guidelines, but then ended up as rules, right? So it's that kind of people. But in addition to this idea of self-righteousness, we see this looked down on everyone else. Other versions may say viewed others with contempt. And this word here used for contempt, it's only used two other times in the Bible. One is when Jesus is being mocked by the soldiers after being beaten uh, and before he was put on the cross in Luke 23, which says, then Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt. 
They mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. And the other time is in Acts 4 when Peter describes this moment. So the whole time, this contempt is how they treated Jesus close to his death. They were, sorry, these people who Jesus was addressing, words, uh, they were, they thought of themselves as perfect. That's the self-righteous. We've done all the things. we followed all the rules. The self-righteous. But they also viewed everyone else as worthless. They had no, no regard for anybody else. They, they didn't mean anything. All right? So we're going to get into this in verse 10. It says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying about himself, or like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Can you, like, feel the pompous attitude through that? I can. We're introduced to two characters that head up to the temple. And by the language used here, this went up to pray and the come down later on that we'll talk about. Uh, it's thought that this is being thought as in the temple in Jerusalem, okay? This was a parable that Jesus told, so it's just kind of what we think Jesus was thinking about. It wasn't an actual, like, this happened, all right? But we're thinking that it happened in the temple because of how it's, it's talked about. And it was probably either at 9 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, as those were the times that people went up to pray uh, during this, this time in the, in the New Testament. Uh, they could have been at another time. We don't know. But that's kind of what we're thinking. Either 9 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, there's lots of people gathered around to pray. But, and that's just giving you some context to what might have been in Jesus' mind uh, when he told this parable. The Pharisee here, you guys remember how Pharisees are viewed in the Old Testament? Like, we view them as bad, but the Old Testament people, or the New Testament people, they view them as good up until Jesus. He would have been the image of righteousness. Everyone listening to this from Jesus would have thought highly of the Pharisee as they were the religious leaders. They were the pastors and the people there teaching them about God. It's somewhat similar to how people in this world view pastors as higher than everyone else, which is not right because we're not. We're just like y'all. We just get up here and are terrified about being up here. But uh, we, we, we sometimes get that, but the, the Pharisees had that way more. Like they were the religious leaders. They also, you know, made themselves look better like this, we see the Pharisee doing here, so it was even more so. Now, the Pharisee had some, let's look at his actions. First off, he stood, which was a normal posture for prayer during this time. Prayer was meant to be done sitting, standing, bowing, kneeling, or lifting of hands. Okay, those were the options. So he's in the right there, standing. While standing up to pray is fine, however, we see that he is standing up for people to see him pray, and that was not okay. The Pharisee stood as close to the Holy of Holies as he possibly could. Okay, you come into the chamber, and there's a door, you know, an exit door and an entrance door. And the Holy of Holies, that place is where God dwelled. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And that was where God was, right, in, in this time. Okay? So he was as close to the door as he could, and he was kind of like talking to both the people and God a little bit, but probably more the people. But no matter how physically close he was to the Holy of Holies, where God was, he was miles away from God spiritually, right? And this reminds me of Matthew 6, 5, where it says, Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on their street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. This is a prime example. This parable that Jesus is telling is a prime example of what he told the, the disciples and those there at the Sermon on the Mount not to do. He said, don't do this. Don't stand up in front of people. Now let's get into the prayer. The prayer can be broken up into two parts with one really overarching theme of the whole thing. This theme that we're going to talk about real quick, uh, you can find that in the praying like this about himself. This was not a prayer to God. This was a showy speech for all to hear. He gave no praise to God. He asked nothing of God. He just got up and spoke about how great he was. He probably was like, you know, holy of holies here, praying to God, really praying to the people, right? Not to God. He wasn't there for God. He was there for himself. He was there to show people how fancy he is. 
Now let's get into the two parts of this prayer. First, we have, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Here, the Pharisee is listing out his qualifications as to why he is worthy of God's respect and blessing. He's saying things like, I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't do any of the sins that the law prohibits or speaks against. He even goes as far as contrasting himself, saying, I'm not even like this guy over here, this tax collector. I'm not like him. I'm better than him. He was laying it on thick. And after that, after he does his qualifications, then he lists his extracurricular activities, which is a hard word to say. He goes above and beyond of what was expected of him, and he lists those out. He's like, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. See, in this time, Jewish people were required by Scripture to fast once a year, and that was in preparation to the Day of Atonement. They would fast, and that was required by Scripture. But remember the, the book of all the extra rules I came up with? They had this, in this book, there was a part where it said, you should fast twice a week if you want to be really good. And that was usually Monday and Thursday. So here are the Pharisees saying, look, I'm doing extra. I'm following the extra rules. But we, then we get to this, I give a tenth of everything I get. And you think, okay, that's not bad. That's just what is required of him, right? He's, he's tithing 10%. But it's, not the, it's the way it's put. He says, I give a, 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 I give a tenth of everything I get, not everything I earn. That was what he was supposed to do. He's supposed to tithe on what he earned. His paychecks, they didn't have paychecks, but those, right? But he's saying, I give, every, or I give a tenth of everything I get. He was tithing on everything, on anything that was given to him, any donations that were, were given to him. And that, I, I can follow that one. But, you know, if someone took him over to Lenny's to get a sandwich, he's tithing a tenth of that sandwich. And the reason being is, what if the guy who bought me this sandwich hadn't tithed? What if he's using untithed money to buy me a sandwich. I better make sure that, that my portion is tithed on, all right? So he was going above and beyond. But is that what God wanted? No. Y'all don't respond like kids do. Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't at all what God wanted. No. This was very much a performative presentation. That's point one. Can you guys tell that these words are very jerry They are. <laughs> So this Pharisee was giving so much to God. He was showing so much of how much he was worthy. He was like, oh, I got, I'm doing all the things you want. I've got it. You, look at me, God. He was putting in all the work. But that's not at all what God wanted. And then we come to the tax collector, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, tax collectors in this day were absolutely hated. They were often Israelites, and because this tax collector in this story is in the temple praying to God, we can assume that he was an Israelite, okay? He was in the temple praying to God, and we can assume that, but he is also working for the occupying oppressive government of the Romans, right? He is a traitor. He's working for the bad guys. They came in, and they are, have taken over Jerusalem and Israel, and they are, you know, requiring tax and all these things that aren't what God set out. Not good. So he's a traitor. But on top of that, he was a lying thief. Tax collectors often in this day, would, they would take taxes as they were supposed to, but they would take extra tax to keep for themselves. So if the tax was $10 or whatever, then he would take 20 and he would keep 10 for himself and give 10 back to the Romans like he was supposed to. He would often become very wealthy because of all the money that he stole from people. So these, this tax collector here would have been the complete opposite the antithesis, big word, uh, for the Pharisee. For the people hearing this story, they would have seen the Pharisee as the right guy. They, he's the picture of righteousness. Look at him. Look at him go. He's doing all the good things. He's doing all the extra things. But this tax collector, he was the epitome of sin. And then this, this story starts to focus on him. He comes to the temple like the Pharisee. However, he's not right up close to the Holy of Holies. He's standing far off. He's barely in the room at all. Kind of like when my daughter gets in trouble and she knows that she's in trouble and I call her over to me to talk about, you know, what she did and how that was not right. And she kind of like slinks herself down and she's like, I'm going to be as small as possible. My wife is laughing because she can see it. I can see it too. And it's very funny. And she kind of hides her eyes and she's like, so she'll like slowly walk up to me. Please don't look at me. I know I did wrong, right? That's what he's doing. He is ashamed 
of himself. He won't even look up to heaven. And this reminds me of Isaiah 6, when Isaiah had that vision of being in God's throne room, and in his utter shock and fear, because of how unworthy he is, he fully realizes how worthless and unworthy of anything God gives us we are, because he sees God in all of his majesty, right? That's how this tax collector is coming. Similar to how Abraham, when God comes to Abraham in Genesis 17, Abraham falls face on the ground. He's literally like, I need to be as small as possible because you are so great. I am worthless. That's how this tax collector came. He came worthless, dirty, but he came to God humble. And he spoke. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This term here for have mercy is, literally means to make propitiation for me, which is only used one other time in the Bible, and it's in Hebrews when the author of Hebrews is talking about what Christ did for sinners on the cross. This tax collector got it. He came to God, brought nothing but sorrow and humility. He had a penitent prayer. Boom. Look at that. And you know what? He was rewarded for it. This comparison here of between the Pharisee and the tax collector, it reminds me a lot of, of many different examples we have in the Bible. But two that stuck out the most uh, were Cain and Abel, as well as Saul and David. You see, with Cain and Abel, Abel brought some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. He brought the best of the best, the first and the best. The fat portions was like the, the big deal stuff, okay, apparently. Abel saw God in his rightful place and put himself, Abel, lower than God. He said, God, you deserve what's best. I deserve what's left over. And maybe not even that. But Abel, not Abel, sorry, but Cain, however, he just brought some of his stuff. He just brought some of his, pro his produce. Cain didn't give God the best. Cain gave himself the best. And we see how that worked out for him in Genesis 4, 4, where it says, The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Abel understood the place of God and placed his offering accordingly. He brought the best of the best. Cain, however, put himself above God. He did not put God where he was, and he saw himself as doing God a favor. And it didn't work out for him. He said, all right, God, here you go. Here's some fruit. Have at it. Not great. As for Saul and David, we see Saul starts out pretty well. In the beginning of, of 1 Samuel, we see that the first time Saul met Samuel, he didn't feel worthy to come to Samuel without a gift. He was talking with his servant. They're looking for their donkey, and the servant's like, let's go ask Samuel. Maybe he can inquire of the Lord. And Saul's like, we can't go there. I have nothing to give that guy, and he speaks for the Lord. I'm not worthy of that. I need to at least bring something because he is important. And he's just a messenger of the Lord. He was humble. And then later, after Saul had been anointed, but when Samuel was first casting lots for the king of Israel, he did this because uh, he wanted Israel to know that God was in this. It wasn't just Samuel choosing who was the next king. It was God. So they cast lots. Uh, and in 1 Samuel 10, 21 through 22, we see that. Finally, the Saul, son of Kish, was selected. But when they searched for him, they could not find him. They again inquired of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord replied, There he is, hidden among the supplies. Saul was terrified. He's like, I am not king. I'm not king material. I'm not worthy to be king. And he was hiding. I can get that. However, later we see Saul's heart change. When a battle was about to commence, between Israel and some of the neighboring countries, uh, Samuel was delayed, and Saul decided, I will perform the offering that God wants so that he will be with us in this battle. That was his thoughts. And this is the Lord's response to that thought, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul was rejected because he tried to give the things God want, he thought God wanted. 
He tried to do the offering, like this is how we, we make sure we win battle. We do this thing for God. But that didn't work out. That's not what God wanted. He wanted his obedience. Saul never really repented for this. We see many times that Saul, it seems like he repented. He felt sorry for the consequences and sorrow for it. He asked for forgiveness, but he had no remorse for his actions. He had remorse for the consequences. He never really repented of his sin. However, David, on the other hand, when Nathanael called David out for his affair with Bathsheba, David tore his clothes and repented, not for the punishment, but for the sin itself. And God restored him. If you come to God thinking that you've done God a favor, you will not be satisfied. Verse 14, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This would have been an absolute shock for the audience there. Remember, they saw the Pharisee as the good guy. And they saw the tax collector as the bad guy. Similar to how all of you are like, okay, the Pharisee, he's bad. The tax collector, he's good. We've got to follow what the tax collector did, not what the Pharisee did, right? It's kind of where y'all are already at. That's how they were acting, but switched. They were thinking, as Jesus told this story to them, they were probably thinking and nodding along, being like, yeah, look at that Pharisee. Look at him go. He's doing all the right things. And then they're thinking about the tax collector, like, yeah, you better get in there, and you better repent, you evil heathen. But... Jesus shocked them all that day by saying the tax collector left justified, not the Pharisee. Interesting. A couple of little word notes here, fun little things. Uh, First, this I tell you that we have in verse 14. Jesus here is saying, I know because I am God. He put himself in the judgment seat. He put himself as God in this, which is awesome. Second, this justified we see here, it's not just the, the, the justified that you would get in sacrificing on the Day of Atonement. It's not that. It's not just, okay, I'm good for this past year. Next year, I'll, I'll sacrifice. I'll do this again for all of the, that year. No, it's not that. This was a permanent justification. He left there permanently justified. And lastly, this proverb that Jesus gives us, this everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This word exalt here is a synonym for salvation. So it could be read, everyone who tries to save himself will be humbled, but the one who, sa- or the one who humbles himself will be saved. Jesus here gave us a, pen- or a pertinent proverb. It's different in your bulletin. I sent Isaac the wrong thing, sorry. Isaac was asking all week for, for my notes, and I gave them to him like Friday at three because I'm, so slow at this. But pertinent proverb. So you can cross that out. Pertinent. It's spelled P-E-R-T-I-N-E-N-T because for my dyslexic friends in here. So for us, great. We, we read a story. We did a history lesson. But how do we apply this to us? We're not Pharisees, although sometimes it can seem like that maybe. For us, be on your guard where your heart is. You may be doing great things for the church or for Christ, You may be tithing 20, 30, 40, 50% of your income. You may be taking people to Lenny's and and tithing on your sandwiches. You may be serving the church more than you're being served. You may be going above and beyond in whatever way that you think God needs you to. But if your heart is in the wrong place, if you're doing this as a favor to God, you will not be satisfied. In the John MacArthur commentary on this passage, I I love how it was put here, so I'm going to read it to you all. It's put like this. The damned think that they are good. The saved know that they are wicked. The damned believe that the kingdom of God is for those worthy of it. The saved know that the kingdom of God is for those who know that they are unworthy of it. The damned believe eternal life is earned. The saved know it's a free gift. The damned find God's commendations. The saved seek his forgiveness. Wow. I heard an old story the other day. Actually, I read an old story the other day, and it went like this. A man dreamed that an angel had escorted him to church one Sunday. There he saw the pianist playing. He saw the praise team singing their heart out, the guitarist, the drummer, everybody, even the congregation, were all in it for this worship set. They were all in, worshiping their heart out. But there was no sound. He could hear nothing. He asked the angel, is this the way worship sounds in heaven? 
And the angel turned to him and said, You hear nothing because there is nothing to hear. These people are engaged in worship, but their hearts are on other things, and their hearts are far away. What does God really want? What does God really want from us? God wants us to want him. God wants us to let him fix our problem. God has already set up a way for us. This way for us to have a relationship with him that we so desperately need, he set that up. He sent his son Jesus to die on a cross, live a perfect life, die on a cross for our sins, take the punishment that we deserve, and then die and come back to life, proving that he really is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. But we must come to him realizing that he has done everything and that we have done nothing. There's nothing we can do to help. There's no favors needed to give to God. We must come to God humble. If you come to God thinking that you've done him a favor, you will not be satisfied. Let's pray.